Uh, so I'll just turn off my camera and sit silently on that ground. Okay, so I guess I'll start right at right at twelve thirty for the introduction. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. So um, good good afternoon or good morning, um, wherever you find yourselves uh, today. Um, I'm very glad you could join us for uh, today's uh, uh, plenary session. Um, and it's my pleasure to um, introduce today's speaker. So my name is Paul Kushner. Um, I'm a professor at the Department of Physics at the University of Toronto. It's a great pleasure to introduce uh, my colleague in Toronto, uh, Deborah Wunsch. So, uh, uh, professor Wunsch is an assistant professor in the Department of Physics in the School of the Environment at the University of Toronto. She leads an energetic research group undertaking careful measurements of atmospheric greenhouse gases and how to interpret these observations in the context of the global carbon cycle. Since joining us in uh, 2016, uh, she's focused on two projects reflecting her interest in uh, uh, carbon cycle dynamics from urban to global scales. Uh, and I I'll try not to steal too much thunder uh, by just uh, briefly mentioning that one of these is a kind of roving bicycle mounted net network of urban methane emissions around the GTA. And also she's been setting up uh, uh, to increase uh, our research, uh, our capacity to uh, track greenhouse gas concentrations in the boreal forest region of Canada. Um, and this uh, last work is uh, uh, part of her leadership of the, um, uh, as chair of the Total Carbon Column Observatory Network or TCON. Um, and this is an international project that's responsible for ground truthing uh, greenhouse gas retrievals from satellites like um, uh, NASA's Orbiting Carbon Observatory. Uh, and for this work, uh, NASA's recognized Professor Wunsch in 2016 and 2018 uh, for her work uh, in, in, on the uh, science and validation teams for OCO2. Uh, Deborah is a great colleague um, and a smart and articulate representative of this key area of carbon cycle science. So I'm very pleased that you'll get a chance to hear her perspective on using atmospheric measurements to examine the Earth's carbon cycle. Deborah, I'll pass it to you. Um, so let's say that you're um, on, on the hook for 40 to 45 minutes uh, uh, to talk about your research, and then we'll take Q&A. Um, there's a Q&A window that I invite you to uh, submit your questions to, um, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll handle the discussion um, that way as, uh, af after your talk. So I'll go ahead and uh, turn off my camera, and please go ahead, uh, Deborah. Thanks very much. All right. Thank you very much for the nice introduction, Paul. And uh, thank you all for coming to the talk today and for inviting me to speak at this Congress. I'm really excited to tell you about the atmospheric measurements we've been collecting in support of carbon cycle research. Um, I would not be able to speak about these measurements if it were not for the efforts of my colleagues from around the world, and in particular, the members of my research group and our collaborators at Environment and Climate Change Canada, uh, the TCON partners, and the OCO2 science and algorithm team members. So the measurement systems I will describe today were formed to help understand the impact that humans have had in perturbing the natural carbon cycle. The natural carbon cycle is the flow or flux of carbon between the terrestrial biosphere, trees, grasses, and other vegetation on the land, the oceans, and the atmosphere. I'm going to talk both about carbon dioxide in this talk and about methane, so um, I'll be flipping back and forth between those two. So the natural carbon fluxes are very large. Um, on land, the fluxes are driven by photosynthesis, um, the process by which plants remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere as they grow, um, and respiration as they release the carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere um, at night and during cold winters. Um, other land-based fluxes come from wetlands and soils, which have seasonal variability. Um, oceans exchange carbon with the atmosphere over longer timescales, on the order of hundreds of years or so, and these fluxes are roughly in balance in the natural carbon cycle on an annual scale. Humans, of course, have come along and we've been perturbing the natural carbon cycle by burning fossil fuels um, and other industrial processes and altering our use of the land, for example, clear cutting agriculture and urbanization. 
These perturbations are small compared with the total magnitude of the natural carbon cycle fluxes. But because the natural carbon cycle fluxes very nearly balance, this human perturbation becomes very important. And we can see the imprint of human activities readily in measurements of atmospheric composition. So this is another way of looking at the problem. Fossil fuels and industrial processes account for almost 90% of the sources of carbon released to the atmosphere, with the remainder stemming from land use change. So that's on the left-hand side of this figure here. I don't know if you can see my, there we go. You can see my uh, laser pointer. Yes, we can. Thank you. Um, the three places where the carbon can remain or accumulate once they're released are the atmosphere, the terrestrial biosphere, and the oceans. So these are called what we call the carbon sinks. And because carbon dioxide and methane are both long-lived greenhouse gases, they build up in the atmosphere over time. Methane has an atmospheric lifetime of about a decade, and carbon dioxide's atmospheric lifetime is much longer, perhaps 100 years. So I mentioned already that the fluxes from the natural carbon cycle are large, but that on an annual average, the natural carbon cycle is largely in balance. So in this figure here from the Friedling Stein et al. carbon budget from 2020, the authors show that the human influences are increasing. So time starts in 1850, there we go, 1850 and comes to the present day on the x-axis. Um, and positive fluxes are emissions or sources of carbon to the atmosphere and the negative fluxes are the sinks. So fossil fuels in this gray, um, gray bar here and land use change are positive and the oceans in this green blue color, um, the land in green and the atmosphere in blue uh, components are negative fluxes. So this figure nicely illustrates the variability of the problem. The sinks provided by the terrestrial biosphere labeled land in this graph vary widely from one year to the next, and so does the atmospheric burden. So if we're interested in assessing the human impacts on the carbon cycle, our measurements of atmospheric carbon must be precise and accurate enough to measure small perturbations on large fluxes with significant interannual variability. This is quite a challenge. There are other mysteries of the carbon cycle that are yet to be understood. You might recall from the previous slide that the oceans and terrestrial biosphere continue to somehow keep up with rising emissions. And to describe this more quantitatively, we can define the term airborne fraction of carbon dioxide as the ratio between the atmospheric growth rate, which is how much more carbon dioxide has been added to the atmosphere each year, and the ratio of that to the total annual emissions. And that's plotted here on, the, uh, uh, on this figure on the left-hand side, so as a function of time. The airborne fraction has remained roughly constant at about a half since measurements began. Essentially, this means that for every four molecules of carbon dioxide that enter the atmosphere from fossil fuel burning, two of those molecules remain in the atmosphere, one is absorbed by the oceans, and one is absorbed by the terrestrial biosphere. We don't know exactly why the airborne fraction is one half and when that might change. Another challenge is to identify the regional or sub-regional sources and sinks of carbon dioxide and methane. Over the past decade or so, we've made significant progress in identifying some of the largest sources and sink regions, but now we wish to identify more precisely which facilities or regions emit, how much, why, and how to stop it. We want to know what the role of the forests will be in the future and what the underlying mechanisms are to cause these changes. What will be the role of fires, drought, or increased greening of land previously too cold to support vegetation? What is the role that cities play in the carbon cycle? To answer these questions, we require high quality atmospheric measurements. The fluxes of carbon from the terrestrial biosphere and oceans flow through the atmosphere, making the atmosphere an ideal place to search for answers. The global methane and carbon budgets are shown in schematics on the right-hand side of this slide. And most of the fluxes cycle with the atmosphere on various timescales. So because of the nature of the carbon cycle with small perturbations, again, on top of large, well-balanced natural fluxes that vary significantly from year to year, we need long-term measurements that is multi-decadal time series, and those are crucial. Furthermore, both carbon dioxide and methane are potent greenhouse gases, and together they're responsible for over 80% of the energy imbalance that's causing our planet to warm. So we have been recording near surface concentrations of carbon dioxide since 1958, when Charles David Keeling at Scripps Institution of Oceanography first began his measurements atop Mauna Loa in Hawaii. That carbon dioxide record is shown on the left-hand side of this figure. 
a time beginning in 1958 until the present on the x-axis. The y-axis so shows the concentration of carbon dioxide in units of parts per million or micromoles of carbon dioxide per mole of air. The red line <clears throat> that goes up and down like this shows the monthly mean values and the black line is the annual average. You can clearly see the influence of the terrestrial biosphere in the seasonal cycle of the red curve. When the curve descends in the northern hemisphere uh, spring, um, when the growing season in the northern mid-latitudes begins, the, there's a decline in the CO2 in the atmosphere. And after the growing season ends, respiration dominates over photosynthesis, releasing the carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. The seasonal pattern lies on top of a slow long-term increase caused by the buildup of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere from human activities. The plot on the right-hand side is the global monthly median, mean methane concentrations near the surface. It shows a much less monotonic increase over time with a hiatus period in the methane growth rate between about 19, 1999 and 2007. A seasonal cycle in methane is apparent as well, um, but it's driven by its main chemical sink, which is the hydroxyl radical, OH, and by seasonal emissions, for example, from wetlands. It appears that the long-term increase in methane has accelerated since around 2015, and there's been no scientific consensus yet to, that has emerged to explain either the hiatus period or the recent acceleration. So the measurements I just showed are part of a global in-situ network, which forms what we call the gold standard measurement network for carbon dioxide and methane. This network comprises surface, tower, uh, aircraft, and high altitude balloon measurements. And the measurements are extremely precise and accurate. The measurements are carefully calibrated to the World Meteorological Organization's trace gas standard scale, which is good to about a 10th of a part per million uh, in carbon dioxide and two parts per billion in methane. The network has established a long-term multi-decadal high quality record and has been extremely valuable for understanding the carbon cycle as well as we do today. In situ ne networks are limited in their spatial coverage for many reasons, including practical ones like site access and maintenance. To obtain global coverage, it's often necessary to go to space. And space-based measurements are fundamentally different from in situ measurements. They have to use remote sensing techniques to measure through the entire atmosphere to obtain information about concentrations near the surface where the source of the sinks are located. Almost all the currently orbiting satellites that measure carbon dioxide and methane do so by measuring reflected sunlight off the Earth's surface. So um, sunlight passes down through the atmosphere, reflects off the surface, and then returns back up and is intercepted by um, the satellite. Each time sunlight passes through the atmosphere, it encounters atmospheric molecules, including carbon dioxide and methane, that absorb certain wavelengths. It's the reduction of sunlight at these wavelengths that reaches the satellite that provides the information about the atmospheric abundances of carbon dioxide and methane. From space, with the current generation of instrumentation, it is difficult to distinguish the altitude at which the light is being absorbed, so we typically get information about the total column of the trace gas from the surface up to the top of the atmosphere. Of course, it's important that we can measure satellite, uh, that we can compare satellite based remote sensing measurements of carbon dioxide and methane to the in situ network. Um, and that is that the satellite and in situ me measurement scales are the same. And this is because we want to put both into the same models and be able to assimilate them to, together to be able to come up with um, fluxes and various other things that we're interested in. So to do this, we use a transfer standard. We need a transfer standard. Um, and this role is often filled by the total carbon column observing network, which is a ground based remote sensing total column network of instruments that measure direct sunlight. So we place instruments on the ground and we stare directly up at the sun instead of looking at reflected sunlight from the ground. So the TCON is comprised of 28 stations worldwide, and it's designed to measure globally consistent, precise and accurate total column amounts of carbon dioxide, methane, carbon monoxide, nitrous oxide, water vapor, HDO and HF. Many sites have added longer wavelength detectors that can simultaneously measure other interesting carbon cycle relevant trace gases like ethane, acetylene, carbonyl sulfide, hydrogen cyanide, propane, and a host of other species as well. There are two operational TCON stations in Canada, one at Eureka Nunavut, it's our highest latitude station, and one in the Boreal Forest at East Trout Lake at the Environment and Climate Change Canada facility there. 
A third station is planned to be installed at the Canadian High Arctic Research Station in Cambridge Bay in 2023. So the network's objectives are to constrain global fluxes of carbon and improve our understanding of the carbon cycle and particularly the role that humans have played in perturbing it. We also provide crucial validation data sets for the currently, currently orbiting satellite programs, such as Japan's greenhouse gases observing satellites, NASA's orbiting carbon observatories, China's TANSATs, and Europe's uh, tropospheric monitoring instrument called TRIPOMI. We will also support future satellite instruments like NASA's GEOCARB and France's MICROCARB. An array of photographs from a few TCON stations around the world um, show you some of the variety of TCON covers in terms of topography, climate, and land cover types. So this is the famous bright red pearl laboratory up in Eureka, Nunavut. This is a very moody picture of the Boreal Forest Station at East Trout Lake. This is the, the Great Plains site. We also have a couple, uh, this is Darwin, Australia, the northwestern bit of Australia. Um, we've got a couple of urban stations in LA and in Paris. Um, and you can see this is in New Zealand, so lots of different types of places and, and interesting locations around the world. This figure shows the time series of the TCON uh, carbon dioxide in the top panel here. Keep losing my, my pointer. Um, carbon monoxide in the middle panel and methane in the bottom since the network's inception in 2004. The colors represent the total column value. So blues are lower values and reds are, are, are higher values. So you can see the slow secular increase in CO2 over time going from blues to reds over this time period. And you can see a clear seasonal cycle in the Northern hemisphere going from the oranges to the greens, the oranges to the yellows and so on as time, as time moves from left to right. Um, in carbon monoxide, you can see a strong seasonal cycle in the Northern hemisphere and a very strong North-South gradient with a lot less CO in the atmosphere in the Southern hemisphere than in the Northern hemisphere. And you can see the rapid increase in methane um, that's occurring in recent years uh, in, the, in the methane record. And you can also see some of the seasonal variability as well. So making accurate and precise remote sensing measurements of carbon dioxide is actually quite challenging. Not only do we need very high precision and accuracy because the signals of interest are small perturbations on large variable fluxes, but the variations in carbon dioxide in the total column are much smaller than those near the surface. This is illustrated by the figure on the right here, um, which shows modeled CO2 concentration on the x-axis and the pressure on the y-axis, starting from 1,000 hectopascals to the surface up to the top of the atmosphere. Each line represents a local noon profile of CO2, that is the variation in CO2 as a function of pressure. These profiles were created for um, the East Trout Lake Boreal Station. The colors represent the month of the year, um, and I plotted this as a function of pressure because the pressure represents the mass of the atmosphere overhead, and you can think about a total column as the mass weighted average of carbon dioxide through the atmosphere, so it makes it easier to sort of visualize. So you can clearly see in this figure the seasonal cycle in carbon dioxide with winter months showing um, larger uh, CO2 near the surface and the growing season months showing lower carbon dioxide near the surface. And the seasonal variability is much smaller as you move up into the atmosphere. The total column then being the mass weighted average therefore has much less seasonal variability than you would measure near the surface or even in the tower or aircraft measurement that would only cover sort of this altitude range. And on top of that, remote sensing retrievals rely on spectroscopic information about the interactions of light and the atmosphere in, um, and molecules in the atmosphere. And you need good meteorological information about the atmospheric state at the time of the measurement, and you really need to maintain the optical alignment of your instrumentation really well um, to be able to make these, these measurements. But despite all of these challenges, there are still some scientific advantages to measuring the total column. The profile of carbon dioxide is affected by plant photosynthesis, which removes carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, respiration, which then releases carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere, other emissions of carbon dioxide from, for example, fossil fuel burning. And the profile is also affected by vertical transport that can redistribute the carbon dioxide vertically within the column and advection, moving the carbon dioxide around the world. The interplay of these processes causes carbon dioxide profiles to vary both diurnally and seasonally. And on the previous slide, I showed the seasonal variation in carbon dioxide profiles over the boreal Canada with higher carbon dioxide concentrations near the surface during the winter and lower carbon dioxide near the surface in the summer. 
A similar effect can be seen diurnally as illustrated in this animation, which I made using tower measurements collected by NOAA at Park Falls, Wisconsin in July, 2004. The x-axis is the carbon dioxide concentration and the y-axis is now the altitude this time um, from zero to 400 meters. And this particular uh, tower is about 400 meters high. It's quite a tall tower. So starting at midnight local time, there are large near surface concentrations that are measured that drop rapidly with altitude. Overnight, carbon dioxide is respired by the local vegetation, but these emissions are constrained to a very thin layer near the surface called the boundary layer, uh, resulting in large concentrations. As dawn breaks and sunlight becomes available, then two things happen. First, the carbon dioxide concentrations near the surface drop rapidly as photosynthesis begins. And second, the height of the boundary layer increases as vertical mixing increases. The boundary layer thickness typically increases until about mid-afternoon, say 2 p.m., and can extend above the height of the tower. From these measurements, one might infer a really large nighttime flux of CO2 to the atmosphere and a modest daytime photosynthetic uptake, but in fact, it's the opposite that's, that's true. The total amount of carbon dioxide removed from the atmosphere during the day at this time of year um, and location is significantly larger than the nighttime release of CO2 back into the atmosphere. But measurements of the total column are insensitive to the boundary layer height because we measure the total amount all the way up in the atmosphere and therefore more directly proportional to the underlying fluxes. So this figure shows the time series of the 2 p.m. surface uh, in situ measurements of the carbon dioxide uh, from the tower in black. So these measurements here in the black dots and I've chosen 2 p.m. again because that's when the boundary layer is typically most well developed. And I've overlaid the daily medium total column amounts in red from the TCON station that's co-located with the tall tower in Park Falls, Wisconsin. So this illustrated that the near surface measurements have a much larger seasonal cycle, seasonal dynamic range, but that they both show similar phasing in the seasonal cycle and a similar long-term trend. So one of the main roles of the TCON is to provide a transfer standard between those calibrated in, uh, surface in situ network and the satellite measurements. So to achieve this, we collect atmospheric profiles over our TCON stations and compare our retrieved total columns with the column averaged atmospheric profiles. So the figure I've shown here um, is from the high upper pole to pole or HIPPO flights in 2009. Um, where this aircraft used mist approach techniques and spirals over several TCON stations to provide these profiles. So basically the aircraft comes in, does this sort of nauseating profile uh, so set of spirals around the, the uh, station and then flies out, or they come and they basically touch down at a local uh, municipal airport and take off again and take as, um, as vertical a profile as an aircraft can. Um, so these are the profiles that you can see in the bottom right hand corner, um, and then we integrate those and compare those directly with our TCON measurements. So this has now been done using aircraft and AirCore, which is a really clever high altitude balloon based measurement system around 80 times for CO2, which you can see on the left here, and for methane on the right hand side. Um, and so uh, and so we've also collected measurements um, from carbon monoxide, water vapor, and nitrous oxide as well, which I'm not showing here. We've done this um, over 30 times for CO2, uh, 80 times for CO2, 30 times for methane at over 10 different TCON stations. So on these plots, the x-axis represents the integrated uh, profiles from the in situ measurements, and the TCON measurements are on the y-axis here. So what you can see is that there's a really good correlation um, between CO2 from the TCON and the in situ, but they do not lie uh, exactly on the dashed one to one line here. So that is essentially because of uncertainties in the spectroscopic um, parameters that we use uh, to do our retrievals for TCON, but we, we just remove this bias from the TCON measurements and we've now essentially placed ourselves onto the WMO trace gas scale. And once we do that, we, this allows the TCON measurements to serve as the transfer standard between the satellite measurements and the surface in situ measurements. So now that these TCON data are tied to the trace gas standard scale, they can be used for satellite validation. Because the TCON measure measures the total atmosphere column, which is the same quantity measured by the satellites, it's reasonably straightforward to compare coincident measurements. The satellites often have special target modes that are designed to collect as many measurements as possible over the TCON stations. So essentially, as they fly over, they stop and stare at a TCON station and take several thousand measurements over the course of a few minutes as they fly over. 
Um, and we use these coincident measurements to evaluate and remove biases from the satellite measurements. So the figure on the right hand side here is uh, one of the recent comparisons between TCON CO2 on the x-axis here and the Orbiting Carbon Observatory 2 OCO2 on the y-axis here. And the agreement is really phenomenal. Um, the first comparisons that we did with the first retrieval algorithms from OCO2 were definitely not um, this good. And so this, is a, this marks a really um, impressive improvement in our ability to um, retrieve uh, accurate and precise CO2 from satellite-based measurements. So in the past decade or so, there have been significant energy and resources put into making the most precise and accurate measurements possible of carbon dioxide and methane from space. And over the next few slides, I will describe some of the successes and challenges of these observing systems as I see them. So on this slide, you can see an artist's rendition of um, what the OCO2 satellite looks like uh, in space. Here I'm showing the past, present, and future of carbon monitoring at least what I'm aware of. Um, the trailblazer in carbon monitoring was the Skiamaki uh, instrument on board NBSAT, which measured carbon dioxide, methane, and many other trace gases from 2002 until 2012. GOSAT was launched in 2009, and it was the first satellite to successfully reach orbit that was designed specifically to measure carbon dioxide and methane to the precisions that we really need um, to investigate the, the carbon cycle. Its follow-on mission, GOSAT-2, was launched in 2018. OCO-2 um, was launched in 2014, and its uh, predecessor, OCO, without a number at the beginning, uh, but one, I guess, uh, was launched around the same time as GOSAT, but failed to reach orbit. Um, so OCO-2 was launched in 2014, and its successor is currently on the space station. Um, it was launched in 2019, and it's scheduled to, um, to leave the space station in, shortly. Um, <clears throat> TANSAT, so GOSAT measures CO2 and methane, OCO2 measures just CO2, TANSAT is very similar to OCO2 and it measures um, just, uh, it, it measures only CO2. Um, and then there's TROPOMI on the Sentinel-5 precursor um, satellite that measures methane and carbon monoxide but not carbon dioxide and that was launched in 2017. So all the currently orbiting satellites are in low Earth orbits, and except for TROPOMI, they take several days to obtain complete global coverage. TROPOMI obtains global coverage daily because it has a very wide swath that it is able to, to make use of. The future of carbon monitoring looks very bright with several near future uh, launches planned. In particular, many of the platforms uh, in this new suite of satellites will measure from geostationary orbit um, and will be able to provide better time resolution over their uh, viewing region. So GeoCarb, for example, which is set to be launched in 2024, will be able to map the Americas from 52 North to 52 South at least once per day, if not more frequently in some areas. So this animation shows the first year or so of measurements from NASA's Orbiting Carbon Observatory 2, or OCO2. You can see the individual stripes of measurements that, that appear at first, and as the video progresses, the measurements build up to provide a global view of carbon dioxide. OCO2 is able to obtain measurements over regions of the world where we have never been able to measure before, especially in the tropics and the southern hemisphere. We still can't resolve all the complexity that we can model. For example, how carbon dioxide advects or flows across, across the planet. And this is what, because of what I previously mentioned. OCO2, like all the current carbon dioxide satellites, measures different places on Earth each day. Um, when the planned future missions are launched, we will be able to map regions of Earth several times each day and be able to do a better job of um, uh, looking at uh, advection of CO2 plumes. So on the following slides, I'll give you a brief and very incomplete look at the new tools and discoveries that have been made using the OCO2 data. So I'm going to start from the point source scale um, with work that, was, um, that has been done and continues to be done by colleagues at Environment and Climate Change Canada, led by Dr. Ray Nasser. And uh, they found a way uh, of computing emissions from individual power plants using OCO2 data. So the figure on the left shows a stripe of OCO2 data um, downwind of a large power plant in India. The enhancement, you can see this is the CO2 on the x-axis and the distance from the source on the y-axis. You can see very clearly the enhancement in carbon dioxide from the power plant's plume shown in red. And then uh, NASA et al. then used these data together with the plume model to estimate emissions from the power plant. 
and they've now characterized around 20 power plants and related facilities in the US, in India, South Africa, Poland, Russia, and South Korea. They have shown that these satellite measurements are helpful not only for quantifying emissions, but also for monitoring changes in the emissions. So continued space-based measurements of these facilities will be crucial for evaluating the impacts of emissions reductions efforts and policies, and the future mapping missions will permit more of these point source emitters to be monitored carefully. So moving up to larger scales, um, Dr. Jana Hakarainen and colleagues have demonstrated that satellites like OCO2 are capable of identifying regional signals of carbon dioxide emissions. The figure on this slide shows OCO2 data averaged over the 2015 to 2018 time period. Um, and to generate uh, this figure, the authors subtracted the mean value at each given latitude from all the data at that latitude. So this technique reveals underlying patterns of emissions. In this figure, the yellow colors um, indicate uh, higher emissions than the latitudinal average and the blue colors lower. So the locations of these emissions are consistent with regions known to produce large fossil fuel and biomass burning emissions. And this sort of analysis can provide information on where country scale or larger emissions reductions have been, uh, reduction efforts have been successful. So finally, on even larger scales, Dr. Junji Liu and her colleagues at JPL were able to use OCO2 data in an assimilation, which is a data-driven model essentially, to figure out where the excess carbon dioxide was coming from during the strong 2015-2016 El Nino year um, event. Uh, more, more importantly, they discovered why the excess carbon dioxide was released into the atmosphere. So El Nino events are driven by a weakening of the easterly trade winds in the equatorial Pacific Ocean, causing increased surface temperatures and changes in precipitation patterns throughout the globe. These El Nino events are known to correspond with increased atmospheric carbon dioxide. So this study was particularly interesting and exciting because it used three satellite products to reach its conclusions. Carbon dioxide from OCO2, carbon monoxide from a Canadian satellite called Measurements of Pollution in the Troposphere, or MOPIT, and a product called solar-induced chlorophyll fluorescence, also measured by OCO2. Solar-induced chlorophyll fluorescence is a byproduct of photosynthesis. When plants photosynthesize, some of the waste energy is expelled as fluorescence photons. And these fluorescence photons can be detected by spectrometers like OCO2 in space, providing us with a new way to measure photosynthesis on ecosystem and larger scales. And carbon monoxide measurements from Moffett help track fires, which produce both carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide emissions. So with these three products together, Dr. Liu discovered that in the 2015-2016 El Nino event, the increased carbon emissions over the land came primarily from three tropical forest regions in South America, in Africa, and in Indonesia. Curiously, in each region, the increase in carbon had a different cause. In South America, it was droughts that caused a decline in photosynthesis. In Africa, hotter than usual uh, temperatures decreased plant, uh, increased plant decomposition and respiration. And in Indonesia, the droughts caused uh, increased fire activity. So now I'm gonna combine all these measurement types together to talk about my group's multi-scale approach to estimating carbon emissions from the greater Toronto area. The graphic that I'm showing here was created by a student in the group, Sabrina Madsen, to illustrate our approach. We wanna evaluate urban emissions and urban forest carbon sequestration. And we do this using several measurement techniques, including uh, what Paul already mentioned, a mobile uh, in-situ lab pulled by a bike, ground-based remote sensing, which are characterized by these iconic uh, white domes, um, and from satellite measurements. So for the, first, I want to explain why we're so interested in cities. So urban areas are an important source of carbon emissions to the atmosphere. And in North America, urban activities are thought to produce up to 80% uh, of the carbon dioxide emissions to the atmosphere. Less is known about how much of the methane emissions are produced from cities. Reducing greenhouse gas emissions within cities is important not only for the climate, which is of course important on its own, but also for air quality, since many of the activities that produce greenhouse gases also co-produce pollutants like carbon monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, and particulate matter. There are also many municipal level climate organizations in place around the world fighting to reduce emissions. And one in particular is called the C40 Cities Network, which is a global network of mayors trying to reduce emissions in their cities. And Toronto has been a member of the C40 since 2005. So the greater Toronto and Hamilton area include the city of Toronto, which is this orange bit here, um, together with Hamilton, Halton, Peel, York, and Durham regions. It's Canada's most populous metropolitan area with around 7 million inhabitants, or just under 20% of the population of Canada. 
And emissions are typically reported to governments and intergovernmental groups like the UNFCCC using what we call bottom-up inventories. These are accounting systems where industries and businesses report their emissions to a group like the Atmospheric Fund in Toronto that combines the information together into a report. So for example, a farmer who cares for dairy cows will calculate their methane emissions based on a standard emission factor for each cow and then multiply that number by the number of cows in their herd. Inventories are incredibly useful because they're actionable. If we know what sector and what component the emissions are coming from, we can regulate or apply other means to reduce uh, those emissions. The challenge with inventories is that unknown emissions are not included, and it is therefore very important to verify and improve inventories using atmospheric measurements. However, existing inventories for the GTHA don't break down emissions by gas, which makes it very hard to monitor uh, from atmospheric measurements. So we've gone ahead and built some of these uh, inventories ourselves or the the academic community has done so. So the best spatial emissions inventory we have for carbon dioxide in the greater Toronto and Hamilton areas from the work of Dr. Stephanie Pugliese and her colleagues at the University of Toronto and at Environment and Climate Change Canada. Dr. Pugliese's inventory is shown in the figure on the left um, and the inset box, this black box which is zoomed in over here, um, shows the GTHA. And on this figure, the warmer or redder colors indicate higher emissions and cooler or bluer colors indicate lower emissions. And these detailed emissions focus on wintertime to avoid complications associated with the biospheric contributions, essentially from plant growth in the growing season. Toronto has a lot of trees. And so to create a CO2 emission inventory for growing season months, we need to accurately quantify the amount of carbon dioxide removed from Toronto's atmosphere by those trees and other plants through photosynthesis. Recent developments in producing this solar-induced chlorophyll fluorescence product, as I mentioned earlier, from satellites have now provided the first step that we need to assess carbon dioxide emissions throughout the year. The image on the right um, shows the solar-induced chlorophyll fluorescence signal over two weeks in June 2019, so in the growing season, measured by the tropospheric monitoring instrument, TROPOMI. Light yellow colors indicate more photosynthetic activity and therefore more carbon absorption by the urban forest than the darker blue colors. And these maps are fascinating. You can see the green belt around the city. You can even see some of the, the river basin systems within the city as well. And so we can use that to try to inform and improve upon the CO2 emissions inventories for the city. The best methane inventory that we have for the region was developed by a PhD student, Nazreen Pak. And it is called the Facility Level and Area Methane Emissions Inventory, or FLAME. This inventory includes all known point source um, and area sources within the city, compiled from municipal reports and other scientific studies. It is this inventory that we use to guide our atmospheric measurements of methane within the city as we add measurements and evaluate the emissions. Um, we will update that inventory as well. So this is the point source. This is breaking it down by sector and by point source. And then if you aggregate them all together, you get this kind of a map where the, the methane in gigagrams per year um, is shown uh, as a gridded, gridded inventory. So armed with these detailed inventories, we've set out to develop an atmospheric monitoring system within the city to identify and quantify point source emissions, observe and monitor city scale emissions, and place our city's emissions into a more global context. So to identify and quantify point sources, we use mobile in situ techniques, where we go around the city by bike and by truck and by streetcar. Um, and then to observe and monitor city scale emissions, we use total column measurements upwind and downwind of the city. And then to place in a more global context, we use satellite measurements. So first I'll describe our mobile in situ measurements. And since around 2017, we've been collecting mobile data from a bicycle pulled cargo trailer that contains an in situ multi-glass gas analyzer. We also collaborate with uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada and they have a truck. We only have a bike, they get a truck. Um, and then we can measure methane, carbon dioxide and water vapor. And we design our routes to survey inventory emitters and sample uncatalogued emitters as well. So this is an example of one of the surveys <clears throat> from 2021. You can see the whole map on the left here and an animation on the right. So the colors, the redder colors indicate larger in enhancements of methane and the purpler colors indicate lower, lower methane. And on the right hand side, this, this is a curtain plot where the height of the curtain indicates the concentration that we're measuring at the time. So you can see it going up and down a little bit. So as this uh, zooms out, you will we'll be coming over in this region here and you will see a very large enhancement in this area right here, there it is. 
Um, and so that is from Kings Mill Park, which used to be a dump. And we see, you can see some enhancements near the Humber River uh, where, there was, where there's a wastewater treatment. And we often see some enhancements down near the, uh, the lake as well. So compiling all these surveys we've collected over the past few years, we can generate maps like this one um, that show where the enhancements of methane are typically observed throughout the city. So green indicates where we've measured but haven't observed enhancements of methane. The yellow, orange, and red uh, squares here show small, medium, and large enhancements that we have observed, uh, respectively. So you can see that there are a few locations where there are large enhancements uh, and more that have medium and small levels of enhancements. And we often see enhancements uh, near, near the lakeshore. So in a paper published by in 2020 by Dr. Sebastian Ars, he took a close look at three different source types. He looked at two um, natural gas compressor stations in gray here and here, uh, two landfills marked in brown here and here, and uh, an engineered waterway called the Keating Channel um, marked by this blue, blue bubble. So using a Gaussian plume dispersion model, Dr. Ars inferred emission rates from each of these sources. And we learned that the flame inventory underestimated, uh, overestimated um, landfill emissions. It seems to underestimate compressor, compressor station emissions, but the compressor station emissions are quite tricky to, to quantify from short, short surveys like these because the emissions tend to be episodic. And it's often just plain luck that allows us to sample a flaring or venting event from these stations. And the Keating Channel, the, uh, the engineered waterway that I mentioned before, um, this is totally uninventoried and it is uh, something that doesn't get included in these, um, these inventories at all and we believe should be included. So this is essentially the mouth of the Don. It doesn't allow, there's, a, there's this channel that doesn't allow the Don to, to um, flood out directly into empty out right, directly into Lake Ontario and the water there becomes anoxic quite frequently and that produces uh, methane. So now that we have a method to assess individual point sources of methane, we need another technique to assess uh, citywide emissions. And this is where the remote sensing comes in. So the idea with our ground-based remote sensing observing system is to place the spectrometers upwind and downwind of the city, regardless of wind direction. Um, the enhancements in the downwind measurements relative to the upwind measurements provide a proxy for city scale emissions. And this is similar to a mass balance approach that's used with aircraft um, and other, with aircraft approaches around sources of interest, but it allows us to monitor these enhancements every sunny day. So in Toronto, we've installed ground-based spectrometers called EM27 suns in the white domes that you, that you can see up here at four locations throughout the city. So in the west at the University of Toronto Mississauga campus, in the east at the University of Toronto Scarborough campus, in the north at Environment and Climate Change Canada's Downsview campus, and in the south at the St. George University of Toronto campus. And we will be installing at some point in the future one at Egbert, um, which is an Environment and Climate Change Canada clean air facility um, to, to make sure that we monitor uh, background levels of, uh, of the CO2 carbon monoxide and methane. So the initial data from these remote sensing spectrometers is quite promising um, and shows that we are able to detect significant enhancements from the city. And we'll be able to use these enhancements to compare with the inventories and compute emissions. So more importantly, with this kind of permanent observatory, we'll be able to um, quantify not just emissions today, but changes in emissions over time as new policies come into effect. And this kind of observing system should be able to provide important feedback on how effective the city's policies are. So the final piece that I'll try to talk about in the last five minutes um, of our city monitoring system is to use satellite measurements to put Toronto's emissions into a more global context. So it's first important to ensure that the satellites that measure over our city are accurate and precise so that we can use the, so we use the ground-based measurements in the city to help validate the satellite measurements. On this figure I'm showing here, um, an example of an OCO2 target mode set of measurements over Toronto, just to give you a sense of how dense these measurements are. And then this figure up here is a comparison between our ground-based measurements on the x-axis and OCO3 on the y-axis. So this is the, the relationship there. There's a bias, but I think that can be corrected as they improve the OCO3 retrievals. Down here is OCO2, which really looks quite beautiful for CO2. And on the bottom right, I'm showing the um, methane comparisons with the uh, tropomy measurements um, on the y-axis here. So armed with this confidence, we can now compare enhancements from satellites in cities around the world. 
So we're going to be trying to use a multi-satellite approach for this as well, um, combining things like the OCO2 thin strips that go through the city like this, the OCO3 um, snapshot area mapping mode measurements that measure a wider area quite densely, um, as shown in the middle here, and then Tropomi, which um, measures NO2 and CO globally every day, but is a little bit sparser in CO, in methane. And so I'm showing here some nice work from a student in my group that's showing the enhancement of methane over the course of a couple of years um, over the city as well. So we're going to be trying to relate all of these molecules and uh, measurements together in, in the next few slides. So I'm going to take you, I'm going to start um, with an example from Los Angeles, um, which is a basin city with really significant levels of pollution. Any of you who've been there know how soupy the air can get from time to time. So this shows um, an OCO2 track down through the LA basin. The basin is outlined in white and it's surrounded by mountains um, on the east and on the north. And the wind direction is going onshore this, on this day. And, this plot on the right hand side shows the CO2 on the x axis and the latitude, and you can see the enhancement coming from the LA basin here. So we can, we can calculate those enhancements from the LA basin from, from OCO2, and we can get enhancements from, uh, from of CO using the tropomi measurements. So tropomi, as I mentioned, measures globally every day. So instead of just taking a slice through the through the valley, we can actually get a, a full map uh, of the region and calculate enhancements from that. And so we want to relate the enhancements of CO to the enhancements in CO2. And we've done that here. And you can see that they are very nicely related. And the nice thing about LA is that it's also very well instrumented from the ground. And so we know what the true value is of the CO to CO2 enhancements in the city. Um, and the first look at these values compared very well with the accepted literature values in, in LA. Um, and this gives us confidence to use this kind of analysis technique using this multi-satellite approach for cities around the world. And this is the sort of results that we get from this analysis. So here is Toronto. This is 21 cities worldwide, and we can perform the same analysis of the enhancement ratio. So this is Toronto, LA is over here. And the blue bars here are the measurements. So the CO to CO2 enhancements that we get from satellite measurements around the world. And then the green and the red and the yellow boxes are from inventories to compare to these inventories. And what we see rel relatively systematically throughout this is that the observations show larger CO to CO2 enhancements um, than, the, than the inventories show. And this tells us that either the inventories have too little carbon monoxide in their inventories, which is what I suspect is going on, or too much carbon dioxide. And there are a couple exceptions to this rule, of course. But it's also really interesting to look at these enhancement ratios because CO to CO2 tells you quite a bit about um, the combustion efficiency of the vehicle fleet in those cities and various other things. And those are important to relay back to policymakers. So to further these results, we also need to build up an inversion model that can resolve city scales, accurately estimate the carbon sequestration from urban forests, and use atmospheric measurements to refine the inventories. So this talk is focused on using atmospheric measurements to understand key questions about the carbon cycle, and in particular, the role of cities in contributing to global carbon emissions. The in-situ networks remain an important part of the suite of atmospheric measurements as they can be calibrated, importantly, and are more precise and accurate than the remote sensing measurements and can be used to identify point sources. The role of satellites is to obtain the full global coverage that is prohibitively difficult to do from the ground and to continually make higher quality measurements at smaller and smaller spatial and temporal scales. The satellites and in situ networks must be linked through a transfer standard um, and that's a role currently filled by the, the TCON. Um, and we use all of these observing techniques to monitor carbon emissions in urban areas like the greater Toronto area and we hope that these kinds of measurements help to inform effective emission reduction policies. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and uh, ask if there are any questions. Thanks very much, Deborah. What a, what a great talk and a great overview of all your research. And uh, I knew you were busy, but you, <laughs> man, you've got a lot going on. Um, so it's great, great to hear all that. We have one question in the Q&A um, uh, from Robinson. Um, and it's uh, the recent sharp rise in methane, particularly in the Northern hemisphere, would that be related to Arctic permafrost melting? The graph of methane by latitude would suggest not. 
Yeah, good question. So this is this is certainly not my my area, but I do not believe that it is caused by um, Arctic permafrost melt or thaw. Um, I don't think that that's the cause. They've been looking at, um, you know, methane is tricky because it's both a sources and a sinks problem. And so um, hydroxyl has been changing over time and the sources have also been changing over time. And so those two things together have caused um, this acceleration. And pe some people think it's, you know, hydraulic fracturing um, in recent years that have done it, but others refute that and say that it's more of the biosphere and wetland and others say, no, it must be related to the hydroxyl radical. Um, so it's still an open question, but I don't, I don't think that the Arctic permafrost thaw is the leading, the leading cause. Yeah, still controversial area, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there, there's one hand up, um, Jonas, but you, you, you need to ask your question through the chat. Unfortunately, I can't, or the, or the Q and A. Um, Bob Sika has a question. Um, a vertical aircraft measurement spirals. How do you keep the ex engine exhaust out of the signal? Carefully. <laughs> Carefully. <Yeah. laughs> I mean, these guys know what they're doing. They've been doing these kinds of things for, um, for a very long time. And I'm sure they have some sort of, uh, I mean, we do sometimes see the, the aircraft exhaust and we kind of, uh, we don't use those data to compare with the ground-based measurements, but the, the pilots are fantastic. <laughs> uh, yeah, that speaks to the team effort you said because required in all this work, right? Yeah, all sorts absolutely. of technical skills and, uh, and, and, and pilot skills. Nice yeah. talk, Deborah from Yi Huang. Uh, you, noticed, you, you noted a systematic bias in TCON compared to in situ. Can you explicate what? spectroscopic issue you mentioned that accounts for this and how does this compare to the vertical variability induced uncertainty so there's yeah there's the TCON uh yeah uh, calibration that uh, he's he is asking about yeah so um so the the spectroscopic issue is basically the ability to so spectroscopy is good to a percent maybe um in terms of the overall um the overall uh, accuracy of the spectroscopy at this point. Um, and, and so if you have a 1% bias, it'll bias everything sort of in the same way, which is why we have a nice offset instead of like a, a, a variable um, relationship. Um, I, this can be related to things like the line shape, like moving from a void line shape to a non-void line mixing and speed dependence kind of, kind of modeling of your line shape. And that helps a lot. And in fact, we've, we've done a lot of improvements on that um, in the TCON to reduce those biases, um, but there still remain systematic biases. And the thing that's most important to us is that every TCON station uses the same spectroscopy and the same um, retrieval algorithm to make sure that if we're all wrong, we're all wrong by the same amount. Um, and so we can remove that later. Um, and the second part, how does this compare to the vertical variability induced uncertainty? Uh, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what you, what you mean by that second piece, but I think the fact that it's a constant offset for all of the, for all of the TCON stations, I think, I hope that addresses your question. And if not, just send me a, an email. There's a, a question from Francis. Um, very nice talk. Thanks. On slide 46, what makes uh, Baghdad and Johannesburg different? I think we that's the... Know. We don't know yet, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, yeah, we don't know yet, but they are they are they are interesting, and something that we're still looking into. Yeah, good question. So, and and to interpret that anomaly, what's so what's what's going on there that that like how that their um, their CO enhancement is anomalous compared to other cities, I guess, right? Well, so in fact, so if you look at Baghdad, yeah, here we go. My, my pointer. So Baghdad, in, in the analysis that we have, the, the CO to CO2 ratios are much lower, which would indicate to me that their, their engine right. efficiency is much higher than what is in the inventory. So I don't know what's been reported to the inventory, um, but, uh, but, but that suggests to me that the inventories are out of date or something's been, <laughs> something's been misreported there. Um, right. But we, you know, we'd have to go really dig into um, where Edgar, which is the the main uh, global emission inventory, gets their gets their emissions from for Baghdad. Yeah. We've been talking a lot about uh, TCON as a as a tool for calibration, and I, I was wondering if if you've been as as you've set up a new station, 
in Saskatchewan and, and you have you showed that nice picture of all the different stations, all their locations. Is there a, uh, is there work going on on just exploiting the TCON data itself? Uh, like lo there's lo long term measurements now and you have like lots of in situ data there. Is, is there um, is, what, what, what value can be gained from them at this point? Yeah, I have a whole talk on uh, <laughs> on the science that we do from TCON. So we've been doing um, lots of different things. Um, we've been doing some urban emissions uh, estimation from from TCON stations alone as well. So LA is a great example of that. It's a soupy mix of all sorts of different pollutants. And so from from the TCON station there, we were able to um, assess methane emissions from, from one of the first sort of data driven methane emissions in, uh, from from the LA basin. Um, and that led to quite a bit of work at trying to figure out where it was coming from. And it turns out that we could we could nail it down to at least 50% of the excess methane in the LA basin was from uh, direct emissions of natural gas, unburned natural gas that flows to everybody's houses and somehow doesn't get burnt. Um, we've also used um, TCON stations in Europe to assess methane emissions there. Um, and it looks like the CO, um, from that analysis, the CO inventories in Europe are, are underestimated for cities in Europe. Um, and we've also been, uh, there's been some, some research done using TCON stations to look at interannual variability of CO2 and how that relates to things like surface temperature um, and how that might impact sort of boreal forest behavior in the future as temperatures rise and the boreal forest has uh, a harder job to do to take the CO2 into the atmosphere. Right. So there's been lots of, lots of, uh, TCON driven um, scientific investigations as well. Cool. Yeah. So what, what, what do you think should be next for TCON? I mean, you've got, uh, you, you obviously have the, the, the network, the infrastructure there in all sorts of places and some future sites, uh, but you also have these new uh, missions coming up, uh, geocarb and so on. So are there, are there missing measurements or uh, uh, insights you've gained so far that would tell you, you know, how to, how to improve the network and, and what you're retrieving? I mean, there's all sorts of technical stuff that I won't bore you all he with here, but um, fundamentally we need, um, it's it's mostly location, I think, I'm trying to find my figure of the, it's quite far back. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> um, where's my map of TCON? So we're, so yeah. there's some pretty gaping holes, right? <laughs> yeah. Mostly Southern hemisphere, you know, parts of, of Russia, um, are completely unsampled. And I think that's that's a major issue for us. Um, the tropics, the Southern hemisphere, um, the, the um, drought regions of the world um, and, and Russia, we really sort of desperately need um, measurements there. And they're hard to do um, geopolitically, they're hard to do physically, they're hard to get to um, and hard to maintain. And so that's something that we've been trying to, to work with partners around the world to try to, to fill those gaps. Yeah. And, and you, a lot of what you've been, uh, what I always thought of TCON is more greenhouse gases and well-mixed greenhouse gases, but you, you are also measuring some short-lived forces. I mean, I guess methane is, long, I guess, long enough lived to be, <laughs> to be uh, um, uh, well-mixed-ish, but still there's, got, there's pretty big gradients. So I guess the more, mm -hmm. the, the, the gappier it is, the, 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 the more you risk uh, sort of missing important short-lived em, uh, em, uh, emissions and things like that. So yeah, right. it seems yeah. like quite, quite a lot of work <laughs> to do there. Yeah, you do have to remember a little bit that the TCON, because it's remote sensing, the footprint is relatively large. So it's not just a very local and in situ measurement right. is, you know, on the scale of a kilometer or something. These are, you know, hundreds of Example. kilometers footprints, but still there's there's definitely these large gaps that we would love to fill. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. I don't see any further questions uh, and you've answered quite a few, um, but I'll just uh, wait, just pause a second to hear, to see if there's any, I didn't, I wasn't actually looking at the chat either. Um, are there any other further questions for Deborah? Okay, if not, well, I'd just like to thank you again, Deborah, for a wonderful talk, so clear and, uh, and, and really covered a, a lot of uh, ground across your, uh, your uh, growing research program. So really nice to hear all that. Um, and so thanks so much for, for uh, uh, presenting this, inform this, uh, this uh, information today. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Bye. Thanks very much, Deborah. Okay, bye.